Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Tiffany Parks. Sometimes on the show, we read an excerpt from a book to get the conversation started. And one of the most memorable programs we ever kicked off that way had to do with glamour. What makes for an experience that feels glamorous, whether it is on the surface or not? The passage we read is from a book called Heating and Cooling, 52 Micro Memoirs by Beth Ann Fennelly. It's such a small excerpt and such a minute moment in the writer's life. And nevertheless, it inspired such an interesting conversation, one that we still think about and talk about to this day. We started the show with Katie reading an example of what a micro memoir is like. Let me read you the very first one to give you an idea. This is not the one we're going to talk about, but it's really, really short. Okay? Okay. This one's called Married Love. In every book my husband's written, a character named Colin suffers a horrible death. This is because my boyfriend before I met my husband was named Colin. In addition to being named Colin, he was Scottish and an architect. So you understand my husband's feelings of inadequacy. My husband cannot build a tall building of many stories. He can only build a story and then push Colin out of it. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so anyway, there are, the whole book is like that, and some are very funny and some are very profound. And we are going to be reading one story from that, and Tiffany is going to be our reader today. So go ahead, Tiffany. This is called Orange Shaped Hole. Yesterday, I remembered an event from 25 years ago when I lived in London for a semester in a flat in Bayswater with six other college girls. I don't know what resuscitated this memory. I've been reading a lot of Brits lately, so maybe it was Virginia Woolf or E.M. Forster. Or then again, maybe nobody. Maybe there's no trail of smelling salts I should trace to that flat in Bayswater. Anyway, one day I got a postcard from my Canadian cousin, a grad student at Trinity in Dublin. Brendan wrote that he'd be visiting friends in London, and he'd look me up. Turns out his friends also lived in Bayswater, just one street over, so he invited me to their dinner party. I don't remember what we ate or drank or discussed. I remember only the long table filled with high-spirited bohemians, intellectuals, internationals, the great unwashed, and how I yearned to be one of them. And I remember the hostess, wild-haired, a bit fleshy, but enviable, enviable. At one point, she reached into the fruit bowl, plucked an orange, tossed it once in her palm, and then reared her arm back like a pitcher and heaved the orange at her transom window. It smashed through the glass, leaving an orange-shaped hole, and bounced down the hall. Everyone laughed. No one got up to clean the glass. Why, at 19, did that strike me as the height of glamour? And why, this is even harder to parse, why, remembering it now, does it still? Now that I'm old enough to know better and spend a good part of my day cleaning up others' messes. Further, why would I have forgotten this for so long? And now I've handed you the orange. I'm sorry, but now it's your orange too. You've just read of a woman remembering an orange thrown through a window without knowing why she remembers this. You will either remember reading this and know why you remember reading this, or you will remember reading this and not know why you remember reading this, or you will not remember reading this, possibly forever. <laughs> I love it. I know. I love it. I think I'm going to have to get this book, or you can send me your copy. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think you should. Let me see. I'll check when the release date is. One second. Oh, it is coming out October 10th. Okay. So it's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Beth Ann Fenley is our author. So I sent you that story. I didn't have a concrete idea of what we would talk about out of that story, but it just made me think of so many things of both what we find glamorous, particularly when we're in a foreign culture, and then also questions of memory, like what you remember and what you don't remember. And then also it really got me thinking of was weird moments in my life when I admired something more about how somebody did something that for some reason I wished I could emulate mm -hmm. whatever their motion was or whatever their bold move was. And I just was wondering if that story stirred up anything in you as far as, <laughs> I don't know, what 
what it made you think of. Well, you tell me you tell me what it stirred up in you, and then I will do the same, but you go first. Well, it's funny, too, because when she says, at the time, I, at 19, I thought that that was the height of glamour. And even thinking of it now, when I know better, it seems like the height of glamour. And I was thinking while reading it, I was like, that is the height of glamour to throw an orange through a window and nobody cares. <laughs> and then I was like, well, why? That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. I... I don't know if glamorous is the word that I would use to describe it. It's definitely cool, like in the sense that people who just don't care, you know, people who just do random things, not worrying about the consequences. When you're a young person, that seems cool for some reason. I don't know. Glamorous to me, why, why do you think it's glamorous? Well, it's funny because I was talking to our mutual friend Suzanne about this last night, this story. Uh huh. And she was saying, well, she's an American girl who's in London. So automatically, whatever is going to happen there. She's an American teenage girl, 19 years old. She's in a foreign country. She's with a bunch of bohemian foreigners. Regardless of what happens, she's probably going to find it more glamorous yes. than she would if it was something that happened back home. Like if she was sitting in her friend's house and her friend threw a softball through the window, <laughs> you would think that's not glamorous. You know, that is like, what did you just do that for? Um, so it's something about it being foreign the situation yeah situational yeah I was thinking about that too I thought when you're in a situation when you're an outsider but you're sort of getting a glimpse into a world that you don't really know a lot about but maybe you think is you know you'd like to be a part of but you're definitely not a part of it and I think the younger that you are the more likely you are to feel impressed by these other people and to feel like they're more sophisticated and more interesting and than what you're used to just because they're different and because you're looking at them from the outside. Yeah, and I'm sure it has something to do with like the books you've read, the art you've experienced. It's sort of like, you remember that Suzanne, when she was in, I don't know if she was like a teenager, if she was in her early 20s, but she did all that traveling around Europe with her boyfriend and her boyfriend's mother for much of the time. She remembers her boyfriend's mother in Paris jumping the turnstiles to get to the subway uh -huh. and how amazing and glamorous she thought that that was. Mm. And she's like, and I know that if I was at home, I would find that questionable behavior. <laughs> you know? It's funny how things can be, you know, not just negative, but how it can really get a positive spin when you're looking at them from a different perspective and from the perspective of a different culture. Yeah. So I was asking... Suzanne, if she had any examples of you ever doing something like this. Me? <laughs> yeah. And she had <laughs> a great so. story. I'm going to play it for you. Oh. It's only a minute and 25 seconds long. Okay. So Tiffany, I, I was living with Tiffany for a month in Rome. <laughs> That's my cat, Mishka. Um, I was living with Tiffany in Rome for a month. Right before I left, we had this party to celebrate, I think it was her like fourth, fifth, sixth year of living in Rome. So her apartment in Trastevere was packed with people. And at one point, pretty late in the party, somebody broke a glass, I think like a champagne flute, and they were really embarrassed. And Tiffany was wearing this like cute little cocktail dress, and she's in the middle of this big conversation and kind of dancing a little bit, I think, at the same time. And this person's apologizing to her for having broken this glass. And Tiffany's like, oh, I don't even like that glass. And she picked up a champagne flute and she bashed it against her kitchen island and like shattered it and then just like <laughs> kept dancing. <laughs> and at the time I was like, that is amazing. I thought it was such a beautiful hostess thing to do, honestly, because I was like, because everybody's embarrassed when you're, when you're the one who breaks the glass at the party. Okay, Mishka is really yelling. When you're the one who breaks the glass at the party, you're really embarrassed. And I was like, Tiffany just made that person feel totally great. And then everybody just like danced on broken glass. It was very glamorous, really. <laughs> Do you remember that at all? <laughs> oh, my God. I remember that like it was yesterday. I remember that completely. I didn't remember that Suzanne was at that party. <laughs> That's funny. But I remembered that party, and I remember exactly who it was. It was my friend Steve, a really, really wonderful guy who I haven't heard from or talked to in a long time. But yes, he was very, very embarrassed, and you know, he's that type of guy. Like He feels guilty about stuff, kind of. Honestly, it was one of those champagne flutes from Ikea. The pack of six is like two bucks or something. <laughs> they were like the cheapest. And, and I just thought, yeah, who cares? And I'm, I was definitely tipsy. 
but uh, but I totally remember that. And that's so funny that she remembers it. It's so funny. It's funny to hear stories about yourself from someone else's perspective. Yeah. Well, we kind of got into the discussion of what makes it something glamorous and not trashy. We kind of settled on this. Maybe it's if it happens in a foreign culture, it becomes glamorous, like something that's foreign from your own. Because I was telling her about an apartment I lived in that didn't require a damage deposit when I was in my 20s. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so, of course, because of that, I was never worried about anything, anything breaking, anything happening, because I wasn't getting any money back anyway. And so I threw a party where we pushed all of the furniture against the wall, drilled a hole in the ceiling and hung a pinata from it. <laughs> and hit the pinata with like some sticks that we found outside until it shattered apart. And we almost put a girl's eye out because one of the sticks shattered in half, flew across the room and hit her in the cheek. But you think back to that party and it was fun, but I don't know. I think that's more in the um, trashy category than the glamorous category. Well, I think that's one of those situations where it really depends like who you are in this situation. Are you the landlord then it's a really trashy situation. <laughs> Are you the next door neighbor? Again, not a really nice situation. Is it your party? Are you like in your early 20s? Mm, you know, it's it really depends on who, you know, what the perspective you're looking at it from. I feel like there are so many examples of this that I've lived in my own life, but like I literally been thinking about it for the past 24 hours and I literally can't come up with anything. I'm like, why am I such an idiot that I can't come up with an example that is similar to this because I'm sure that there are many. She says that even in the story. Why do I remember this story? And why did I not remember this story for the last 25 years <laughs> when I can so vividly picture it today? Like, why did I happen to think of it today? It is odd. Yeah, it's funny because when I read that story, I jumped to thinking about people who did some sort of motion that I admired, like something that's as simple as picking up an orange and throwing it through a window. And I don't know why I made the leap because it seems like a really weird correlation is that um, when I was a first grader, remember when we were in first grade, we used to have those desks that opened, you kept all your stuff inside. And there was this girl named Jaina that for whatever reason, the way that she opened her desk, I admired. <laughs> That's so random. Yeah, I know. And she would sort of put her hands on the side of each side of the desk, thrust her elbows out and then like lift up as if you were balancing a dancer on your hands, you know, like you would sort of do that lift up like I was going to throw a cheerleader into the air or something, <laughs> except that's just how she was opening her desk. And I spent a good part of that year trying to open my desk like that. <laughs> that's so funny that you remember that. I know. And it's just like watching how a person does a certain motion and saying, that seems like the way to do it. That seems cool. That seems pretty. Now, let me ask you, is that something that you remembered just after reading the story? Or had you always remembered that? I've always remembered that. But mm. for whatever reason, this story reminded me of it. I kind of get it. Like, admiration can be so random. Like the things that you admire people for doesn't really have any, sometimes doesn't have any rhyme or reason. And sometimes you admire people for doing stupid things. Like quite frankly, throwing an orange out your window is kind of stupid. Totally stupid. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> what's the point of that? I know. Suzanne was talking about that last night, that if we were sitting in her room and we decided to throw something through her window, she said her mind would start going, oh, great. Now the house isn't secure. Now there's glass all over the patio outside. But that's coming from a 40-year-old person. Exactly. That's the way a 40-year-old person thinks. You know, they think about their cats, or they think about their children, or they think about the money that it's going to cost to fix it. And that's what made it glamorous was that this young woman clearly just didn't care. And I think that's like a very, I mean, in my mind, we all have our like cultural preconceived notions about different cultures. To me, that's like a French thing. And I have some French friends, and I was a foreign exchange student in France uh, when I was 16 or 17. And I just always felt like that was like a French, like a Parisian thing. And that harkens back to all the books that I read when I was a kid, like the Bohemians living in Paris, you know, in the 1830s or whatever, doing stuff like that. And so in my mind, like that whole situation, that whole scene takes place in Paris, even though I know it's London, but... You know, people who just don't care. Is it something in the concept of something that seems glamorous? Does it have to have that don't care element? I have so many champagne flutes. <laughs> I don't even need this one either. Smash, 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 smash. 
Katie here, stepping into the show for a brief moment to say that if you're new to the program, don't be afraid to go back and listen from the beginning, or just dabble through the shows of the past. Most of our topics are timeless. They are as fun today as they were years ago. So please subscribe to the show and then explore. Also, if you're all caught up and you'd love some new content, we are releasing brand new episodes on patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. This month, Tiffany reveals how she remembers so many ancient Roman facts off the top of her head, and I tell you the worst piece of advice I ever followed. All that and more for as little as $5 a month at patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. There are links in the show notes. And one final thing, August is Tiffany's birthday month, and I would love to get her the gift of more reliable internet. We have had all sorts of internet issues in the past year, and this show has been all the harder to make because of it. As you know, Tiffany is in Rome and I am in Seattle. We are always working remote with each other. Help me build up enough money to give her this gift. Heck, give us both this gift. Send a one-time birthday present donation through PayPal at thebittersweetlife.net and send your greetings and well wishes to Tiffany at the same time, thebittersweetlife.net. And now, back to the show. I think there's an element of effortlessness that you have to have in glamour, or at least least it has to appear effortless. One of my favorite films is The Age of Innocence. There's a scene in which, and I remember because I read the book, and I was obsessed with the book before I even saw the movie, And there's a scene, and it's described in the book very briefly. It's like one sentence. And they used it in the film. And it's basically Michelle Pfeiffer's character. And she's arriving at this party. And she could be considered someone very glamorous in this film. I don't know if you're familiar with the film. No. Well, let's just say it takes place in the late 1800s. And she's this very notorious, divorced countess, American countess. Right? So she was married to... I think, um, a Pole, she, she, a Polish count and, and they had gotten a divorce and she's moved back to New York and she's just the talk of the town and everyone's like whispering behind their backs about her because she's so, you know, scandalous. And she kind of has that, I don't really care attitude, at least outwardly. And she just walks into this party. And as she walks into the party, she's like putting on her bracelet. Mm -hmm. And that's to me glamour. It's like, I care so little about this party that I didn't even like finish getting ready. (laughs) <laughs> before I arrived. I'm still putting on my bracelet. That's how that's how little it means to me. And that's how little effort I'm putting into how I look. But yet I look amazing. I think there's definitely something to do with effortlessness. To be truly glamorous and chic. And not chic, because that's a totally different thing. That's like fashion. And I don't think that's really what the author means by glamour. Making the leap, would you say that you ever walked into a party putting on your bracelet because of that scene? I didn't ever do it on purpose, but (laughs) um, being a mother, (laughs) you don't, you don't do these things on purpose anymore. You actually like haven't finished getting ready (laughs) because like you have like a child like screaming and hanging off of you. And of course I don't feel glamorous in those situations, but I think something very similar happened to me when I was trying to get out of the house and I was so like late because of my kid. I had like a couple of bracelets because you know how the style is today. You wear like two or three silver bracelets on the same wrist. And I had, I had these bracelets and I was like, I literally don't have time to put these on before I leave the house. I'm just running so late because of my kid and, you know, back and forth and taking him to daycare and here and there. And, da, da, da. and literally I was at my office. I wasn't going to a party. That would have been way more exciting, but I was <laughs> arriving at my office and I was walking up the stairs of my building and I was like trying to get my bracelet on, like <laughs> as I was walking up the stairs and that scene flashed into my head. I was like, oh my God, I'm so Michelle Pfeiffer today, <laughs> <laughs> but no, not glamorous in that case. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm just not a glamorous person because I get, I bet, and of course it's late where you are and you have a sick toddler, but I bet if I were to push you on it and I would say, what's a glamorous thing you remember me doing? I bet there wouldn't be a thing. No, no, there is. There is. I mean, I don't know that glamorous, like again, I'm not sure glamorous is the right word. Yeah, we should probably look up the definition of glamorous. Yeah, we should. I mean, here's the thing. You are a person who lacks pretension. That's just one of your qualities. You really are not pretentious at all. And I think that most people who 
you know, identify as glamorous or try to be glamorous or come off as glamorous have a little bit of pretension. Like they're trying to look that way at a certain level. Not everybody. I'm sure there are people who aren't, but they're probably very, very rare. This whatever girl who threw the orange through the window, I mean, who knows what was going on in the back of her head and what kind of attention she was trying to seek. And you're just not really like that. You're just one of those people who's very much yourself. You don't really care enough what people think of you, I feel, to try to seem mysterious or glamorous or whatever. But having said that, I will say that I have a few memories of you. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this story because it's a little bit shocking. It's oh not. God. It's not really shocking. It's not really shocking. It was my 25th birthday. Oh, God. I was in the States. I was in Seattle, home from, uh, from Boston, and I threw a party for all of my high school friends, not my high school friends from my high school, but my theater friends from when I was in high school, which is you and Suzanne and Kate and, and a bunch of other people. Do you remember this party? Do you know where this is going? I think so, yes. Well, it was a great party. It was a really great party and it involved things like s'mores and open fires in the backyard and diving into the lake and skinny dipping. Mm -hmm. And for some reason... Well, not for some reason. It's a very natural thing in the, the um, Parks household. Was that if we went swimming at night, particularly, we would go and have a sauna afterwards. Because, as you remember, we had this little sauna, and we had this little sauna in that house. And so, we all piled into the sauna. And I'm not sure what was going on in there, but I feel like we were probably either playing truth or dare. And I mean, we were 25 year olds, <laughs> so like that's a little bit old to be playing truth or dare. But drama drama team drama yeah kids. we were a drama team a we were drama kids but b we known each other since adolescence and so i think we've kind of regressed <laughs> when we were all together we got to regressed back to adolescence i don't know how it happened all i know is that all of a sudden four of you not me but four of you and i know exactly who it was no one needs to name the people. I won't name names. I only named that the other female was Suzanne and there were two males. I won't name names. But you guys all ended up in the shower together. And if I remember, you were all naked. Oh, <laughs> and I... Um, I don't know if we were naked, actually. You were naked. You were naked. Oh, God. Because I, I, I actually Sorry, took a picture. <laughs> I took a picture <laughs> of it. But nothing... Okay. I, I just want to put this out there, and I'm not saying this because Katie's mom is listening, but literally <laughs> nothing sexual was going on. Like, there was no kissing going on. There was no, like, there was no sex at all going on. It was just yeah. a bunch of friends being wild, being crazy. Mm -hmm. Funny thing was, I don't think any of us were drinking. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, I just remember thinking, like, I don't know. I don't, again, it wasn't glamorous, but it was just, like... It was that, I don't care. I'm just going to do something weird and crazy and get in the shower with three of my friends naked and who cares? <laughs> and I should say it was a big shower, by the way. It was a kind of a it large was. shower. Um, and I had this picture of you. I think you had seen me coming with the camera, <laughs> but um, the other three didn't. And you had like hidden behind one of our male friends um, very quickly <laughs> as you saw me coming. And so in the picture, you could only really see your like little face sticking out. <laughs> and everybody else is like, looks the way that you look in the shower, if you're not in a movie, of course. And you're surprised. Yeah. Like everybody else <laughs> looks like totally like red faced and like messy hair and like imperfections in their body and stuff. And you, and of course, you can only really see your face, but you like have this like perfect beautiful shining mischievous little face with your black hair like kind of hanging down and you just looked so perfect <laughs> in that moment I don't know it was just I just never forgot that that's so, so funny I do have memories like that of you and what happened to that picture now we could auction it for donations to the show <laughs> Yeah, except there are three other innocent people yeah, in that no, photo. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it went. It's somewhere. Uh -oh. Yeah, I do remember that very well. Support for The Bittersweet Life comes from Lugs, offering a full range of stylish footwear for the entire family. From boots to canvas options, their shoes are comfortable and fun no matter what season it is. Lugs are affordable and versatile. 
And even if you're working from home, Katie, you still need shoes. You know I need shoes, Tiffany. I haven't bought shoes in a long, long time. So treat yourself. You can never have enough shoes. <laughs> Lugs is offering our listeners a discount of 30% off right now when they visit Lugs.com. That's L-U-G-Z.com. Yes, visit there and enter the promo code BITTERSWEET for 30% off all full price items. That's BITTERSWEET for 30% off. Lugs is a great brand with shoes for the entire family. Stylish, realistically priced, and great for everyday wear. Lugs has a wide range of options from canvas shoes to stylish boots. You should really check them out. You just might find the exact shoe you've been wishing for. Visit lugs.com and enter the code BITTERSWEET. Now, do you have any memories of particular things that you don't know why you remember them? Like, they're so random. Like, that orange through the window. Like, Gina opening her desk? But yeah, I mean, like that, except that's, like, even more bizarre. Like, I mean, something might maybe more recent. Hmm. It's like a little tiny detail like that? Yeah, because I know I have tons of those. Like, little tiny, tiny things that I remember. Even things that people have said and, that, and have just stuck with me. So I'm curious if you have any. Um, well, like what? Give me an example of something. See, I think the orange itself stands out because it's a little, it would be a little shocking. That would have caught her off guard. And the real question is, why did she forget about it? Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Give me an example of something you remember. Okay, this is really, this is really random as well. But I'm, gonna, I'm bringing it up because I was almost the exact same age as, can you tell me the name of the author again? Because I don't have that. Yeah, it's Beth Ann Finley. Beth Ann Finley. So I don't really, I was around the same age as she was in the memory that she has. And so that's kind of why I thought about it. So I was casting my head back to that age. And when I was, I think, 19 or at maximum 20, I went to France. Uh, I have still a close friend who is French. And I stayed with her for a week or so in Paris and then she and a bunch of her friends were going on a road trip down to the south of France, to the southwest of France, near Bordeaux, because there was a festival in a very tiny, insignificant town called Dax, D-A-X. And I wonder if they still have this festival every year. But anyway, so we went down to this festival and we all drove down. There were probably about eight or ten of us in a couple of different cars. I was the only... No, that's not true. I was going to say I was the only non-French person, but that's not true. There were a couple of others. And I just remember sitting in the back of the car and two of the French guys were talking. No, that's not true. There was a Scottish guy and the, the French and the Scottish guy were chatting and this French guy was dating this German girl. So there were actually a lot of different countries. And I was feeling definitely like the same sort of feeling that, that Beth Ann was feeling like of these people are bohemian, these people are international, these people are so much cooler than me, and I want to be a part of this whole thing, but I definitely feel different and, on, and an outsider. And the weird moment that's not a big deal at all, it didn't make me admire anybody, it just stuck with me, was these two guys, <laughs> this French guy and this Scottish guy talking about all of the different nationalities of girls that they'd slept with. Oh, brother. <laughs> yeah. And this, this, this French guy and said, oh, well, and of course German. And he like put his hand on the leg of this, his German girlfriend. And I just thought, these people are so <laughs> just French. I mean, even though the guy he wasn't talking to was, the guy he was talking to wasn't. It's just, I was just like, I'm like so in a different world right now coming from my like little sheltered 19-year-old life. Um, but I remember that moment. And the funny thing is, totally ironically, which is maybe why this moment came to me, was that during that festival, and I guess it's a thing that, that they do traditionally during this festival, is they have a huge orange fight in the middle of the central square of this town. Mm. And there's like hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of oranges and everybody just picks them up and like throws them at everyone else. And there were, like, there were literally hundreds of people throwing oranges in the middle of the square of this tiny French town. And everybody, everybody was dressed with a white t-shirt, a red beret, and a red bandana around their neck, including me. Oh, I love that. Oh, and I have, I have one other little memory from that. And it was that as soon as we arrived in the town, the guy who was driving the car that we were in, pulled over and like there was someone walking up and down the street and sort of was asking him like, you know, 
directions. We were all camping, so he was asking probably for the campsite or something. And the guy had a glass of wine in his hand, the guy on the street. And he handed it to this guy who was driving the car that I was in. Gave him like a sip of his wine, right out of his wine glass. The hand on the leg, the sip of the wine glass are both such small sort of random memories against this giant orange fight. I know. It stands to reason that you would remember the orange fight, but why those details? I don't know. Those little details, yeah. It's funny though when you said, what is something little like that that you remember? The two memories that popped to my mind both have nothing to do with a foreign culture. But one was uh, one of my boyfriends in high school. The last time I ever saw him, I was saying goodbye to him and he uh, put his arms around me and he said, you have a really nice back. <laughs> and <laughs> as you know, I have scoliosis. So I never thought of me having a really nice back. But at the time, I didn't know that I would never see him again. But seeing as I didn't, what a strange last thing to say, <laughs> right? Yeah. As the final, the final line of a relationship. And just that you remembered it as well. Yeah. And then the other thing that popped into my head was advice that a friend of mine was given by his father. And his father was rather absentee. And so he said, my father only ever told me three things. And I thought since he was never around, I should probably remember these three things. It must be important. <laughs> and he told me the three things. And for whatever reason, I remember them. One was, don't do heroin. <laughs> Good advice. Two was, don't sit on your wallet. Okay. And three was, when you meet the right person, you'll know it. <laughs> that is funny that you remember that. Yeah, what strange advice. But all totally reasonable. Yeah, yeah. I wish I hadn't sat on my wallet. Maybe I'd have a better back. <laughs> anyway, to end, why don't we define what glamorous is? And then everybody can go out into the world and see, am I glamorous or not? What's the most glamorous moment I lived through? <laughs> so this is according to dictionary.com. Okay. Two definitions. It's an adjective, of course. Number one, full of glamour, the <laughs> charmingly or fascinatingly attractive, especially in a mysterious or magical way. Mm. That's the first definition of glamorous. And the second definition is full of excitement, adventure, and unusual activity. Wow, I wouldn't have guessed the second adjective. The second they use in the context of like the glamorous job of I see. something like I that. I see. Yeah. Yeah, well, I like those definitions. Then I, I think that... that you can define that orange-shaped whole moment as glamorous in that sense. Because to me, I guess the word glamour is so associated now with fashion and the movie star glamour, like the way you look, which according to these definitions is not at all what it is. Exactly. Charmingly or fascinatingly attractive, especially in a mysterious or magical way. You know what? Let's challenge ourselves to try to be more glamorous in our daily lives. What do you say, Katie? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say one last little thing. I, I have this, um, this, I don't know how to define this person, a friend, ex, ex something, whatever. I'm not going to define exactly a relationship because it was not defined uh, at the time. But let's just say that I used to know someone who, at least it was clear to me, I don't know if it was clear to others, but he, he actively tried to be mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, but I mean, what's the point of that really though? Like, why are you trying to be mysterious? And if you do try, isn't it kind of self-defeating? Because I feel like a truly mysterious person doesn't try. I don't know. Maybe you have to cultivate mystery. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe not. Like, what would he do? Um, oh, he would just be very vague about things, where he was, where he, what he was doing. He would, he would kind of throw these expressions out. They were begging questions. You couldn't not ask, okay, then tell you know, what happened or whatever it was. I can't think of an example. But... Um, yeah, he tried to be mysterious. He had a last name that was the last name of a, a very important corporation, let's say. I once asked him if his family was related to this big, very well-known corporation, and he, and he was very vague about it. He was very mysterious. Like, he didn't answer me either way. Mm. You know, that kind of thing. He was going for the international man of mystery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was his, um, 
image. <laughs> See, I'm a big fan of mystery. I don't know about exactly what he was trying to cultivate, but I do love, especially when we were younger, I used to love to do things that would be unexplainable. For instance, a one other random memory that I can remember is that I was house sitting for a dog in a neighborhood I was never ever in when I was in college. And it was around Christmas time and I would walk the dog at night. And of course, at Christmas, everybody gathers in the front window in their parlors to be around the tree. And so I'd watch families gather and this and that and this and that. And up the street, there was an old woman who every evening would be seated in a chair in her window uh, reading. And I don't know what inspired it exactly, but I got a present for her <laughs> and wrapped it and I just left it on the front doorstep. And of course, I'm not from that neighborhood and I didn't know who she was. <laughs> so there was no way that she would ever know who gave it to her. It would always just be a mysterious package. I liked doing things like that. You know, where you just couldn't put two and two together. There was no way that you could parse it out. You know, she could have never figured it out. I love that. I love that. That's such a you thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God for that. Um, all right. Well, we should leave it there. But if you guys have stories of the height of glamour from your travels or from your day-to-day -day life, we'd love to hear it at bittersweetlife at mail.com, at Twitter at bittersweetpod, or at facebook.com slash bittersweet life podcast yeah until next time this is the bittersweet life i'm katie sewell i'm tiffany parks join us again bye bye we welcome your questions and your feedback reach the show by emailing bittersweetlife at mail.com that's bittersweetlife at m-a-i-l.com